Well, turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 6. We're going to read uh, verses 45 through 56, through the end of the chapter. Mark 6, 45 through the end of the chapter. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people in their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to us now through your word, that your Holy Spirit would minister to us. In Christ's name, amen. Well, there was a time in American history when flying uh, on an airplane was enjoyable. It was a time in American history when you could pack up, go to the airport, and they didn't search you overly intensely and examine you, when you could get on a plane and enjoy a small little microwave meal with courteous, respectful flight attendants, arrive safely at your destination, and then they would wave, the staff of the airplane would wave to you as you walked out, and they'd smile, and it was an enjoyable experience getting from point A to point B. Um, Those days seem to be gone um, of enjoying flying. Um, some of you have probably seen the, the videos the last month or two of um, airline issues and people getting upset on planes and fights and angry flight attendants and people like that who were upset. Maybe you've seen some of those. Um, for example, maybe a month or so ago, there was the United flight where the passenger refused to give up his seat, and they made him give up his seat. Um, the, I guess it was the police or someone came in, and they forcibly removed him from his seat and took him out, and he did what a lot of Americans would do. He got a lawyer, and uh, then they settled, and he's he's probably buying his second or third home now um, with the the settlement. There was another video maybe a couple weeks ago of a a dad who was threatened by a flight attendant. If he didn't give up his seat, they were going to take his kids. They were going to do this, and he's yelling at the flight attendant. Maybe you saw that one. Um, The most recent one came, I think, from Monday in, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, Spirit Airlines, their, their pilots, I guess, are doing a legal slowdown or trying to renegotiate their contracts. So some of the pilots aren't showing up, some are refusing to fly, and they're trying to negotiate new contracts. A great idea to offend most of your customers to get more money. That's probably not a good idea uh, on the pilot's part. So they're, they're causing some shutdowns, and so at this airport in Fort Lauderdale, there were some long lines, and people were getting frustrated and angry, and all of a sudden, it got a little bit physical, a little bit violent. Maybe you saw the, the videos of that. Uh, it was a small riot at the airport in Fort Lauderdale. And ultimately, the police were called in, and they restored peace to the crowd. And I think they arrested three different people. And they were charged with inciting a riot, disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, and trespassing. And it was, if you saw some of the video, it was kind of a chaotic um, scene at the airport there in Florida. The result of that issue there in Florida at the airport was they had to dismiss the crowd, get rid of the crowd, and a lot of people's travels, travel plans were changed because of what was going on. And that's really what happens here at the end of Mark chapter 6. Two things happen. Jesus Christ has to disperse a crowd, get rid of people, and we'll see why in a few minutes why he does that. It makes sense why he does that. And then second of all, the disciples' travel plans across the Sea of Galilee change completely. They're trying to go this way, and they end up going this way because of the the winds, the strong winds that they can't deal with. So Christ has to get rid of a crowd that is assembling and gathering for for 
what appears to be bad reasons. And then he has to adjust the travel plans of his disciples. So what I want to do this morning is first we're going to look at the story and look at it in a little bit more detail and hopefully see some things that may be a, a, um, a casual reading you might overlook. And then second of all, we're going to look at what this story shows us about discipleship, what it means to follow the Lord. And there's a couple lessons here that we'll see about discipleship from this story. So first, let's just look through the story a little bit and see what, what Mark is trying to teach us. Last week, we talked about the miracle of the feeding of what we call the feeding of the 5,000. It's a remarkable miracle. It's recorded in every single gospel. It's the only one that's recorded in every single gospel. And after that miracle, what does Christ do? He urgently gets his disciples in the boat and sends them away. He sends them to Bethsaida. He gets them away, and he's going to get rid of the crowd. The question is, why was Jesus doing this? Why is Christ in a hurry? Why is he getting rid of a crowd? As church planters, I mean, I've, me and Charlie have been to different church planning conferences and different retreats. And all this. The last thing they tell you to do is get rid of a crowd. Uh, if you've got a crowd, you're doing well, right? Uh, Christ does the opposite. He is not going to the church planning retreats that we're going to. He gets rid of the crowd. And so the question becomes, why is he doing this? Why is Christ dispersing the crowd, getting rid of the disciples? We can't ultimately know the, the, the reason, but I think we have a pretty good guess because of two pieces of evidence. In this part of Galilee, throughout the first century, there was continually different leaders who would raise up in the area and would be the political leader to try to go against Rome. And they would try to get people to follow them, and they would try to go against Rome. Rome was not a very tolerant society. They were not as tolerant as we were, are today. Rome would just take you out. You don't go against Rome. And so continually in the first century, there are leaders who would try to oppose Rome to get freedom for their people, and they would be chopped down by the Roman Empire. It seems the crowd wants a political leader. And this guy, Jesus, is a pretty good speaker, pretty good teacher. On top of that, he can feed people. He can heal people. He can do a lot of good things. The other piece of evidence that suggests this, if you read the parallel passage, the parallel story in John chapter 6, John tells us that they were trying to make him king. John tells us in his gospel they want to make him their own president, their own prime minister, their king. And Jesus is refusing that because they don't understand who he is and what he's doing. He is a king, but he's going to be a crucified king. He's not going to be a king that's going to march on Rome. That's not his plan. And so that's why Christ is sending the disciples away. He wants them out of here so they don't interact with the crowd too much and talk about the miracle maybe. And he wants the crowd to go home because they're getting ideas of maybe a revolution. Maybe an idea of a political movement. And so when the disciples leave and Christ gets rid of the crowd, he goes and spends some time alone in prayer. He spends some time in prayer. And Mark only records three different times where Jesus is alone in prayer. And it's at critical moments in his ministry. The first we've already covered in Mark's gospel was when the night before he's going to call his apostles to be his disciples, to be his missionaries. Before he calls them one by one, he spends a night in prayer. The third one is the night before he's going to be betrayed and then executed on a cross. He spends that time in the garden in prayer. The second occurrence is here, and it's at a critical moment because he's getting ready to face more opposition from the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He's got a name in the region. People know who he is, and a lot of folks think he can be their next president, their next prime minister, their next king to go to Rome. And so he spends time in prayer alone. And we can imagine almost Christ on the hillside on the Sea of Galilee praying alone in the middle of the night, spending time listening to the Father, praying to the Father. And sometime around 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. or 5 a.m., Christ looks out on the water (laughs) and sees that his disciples have not made much progress. Maybe he sees a silhouette of their little, little fishing boat and sees that they're not really moving very well because the winds are pushing them, pushing them west. They're not making progress. If you look at your Bible, the text here says they were, they were rowing so hard they were making headway painfully. Or maybe your version, if you have the NIV, says they were straining. If you have the authorized King James Version, it says they were toiling as they were rowing. And so the image there here is of disciples who are fatigued. I mean, imagine the disciples doing an hour or two of CrossFit or Orange Fitness or running the bridge race. They are exhausted. They have nothing left. They're overwhelmed. 
And so they begin to give up. They're making no progress as they're rowing. And Christ sees them and responds to their need. The text says that he goes to them, and, and remarkably it says he intended to pass them by. He intended to pass them by. Why would he pass them by? Don't they need him in the boat rather than passing by the boat? And we'd, oh, if we had more time this morning, we would, we would spend it on this section here of why Mark records this. But I think it's a, it's a very clear reason why he says he intended to pass them by. It is an epiphany. It's in a divine appearance. It's the language, to be specific, of Exodus chapter 33, when the Lord passed by Moses in the rock so that Moses would know the glory of God. It's the same language of 1 Kings when Elijah is there and the glory of the Lord passes him by and there's that fire and the tornado, the wind, and it's ultimately a still small voice. It said the Lord passed, was going to pass him by. It's, it's the image of the, the divine from the Old Testament passing by his people so that they will know that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the same God as we read about in the Old Testament. He is passing them by, just like with Elijah, just like with Moses. And ultimately, it's a fulfillment of what we read in Job. Job, this man who suffered, a wealthy man who lost everything. Job chapter 9 says, God alone stretches out the heavens and walks on the waves of the sea. It's Job chapter 9. Christ is doing that. As he is demonstrating that he is the Son of God, the disciples see him and the disciples are terrified. (laughs) Um, not only are they worn out, now they are totally afraid of what they are seeing because they think it's a ghost. They think it's a ghost that they're seeing, and they are very terrified. And so Christ says, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And here again, Christ is referring back to what you read in the book of Exodus, where God reveals his name to Moses. I think it's Exodus chapter 3. I am who I am. In the Greek, it's the, in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, it's the same reading as what we see here in Mark chapter 6. Christ saying, it is I. Same language. Same language of Yahweh of the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is the image, the word of, of Yahweh. And so the big picture here of this little section, and then we're going to continue, is Christ does what only God can do. He walks on the water, and Christ says what only God can say. I am who I am. He is demonstrating that he is the Son of God. And so for the question throughout the Gospels of who is he, is he a teacher, is he a miracle worker, is he a prophet, is he Elijah coming back? The answer that Mark gives us is very simple. Whereas in the the Gospel of John, John just tells you he is the Son of God, he is the image of, Mark demonstrates it through his words and through his actions here, that he is the Son of God. And it says when he got in the boat, When Jesus Christ, the Son of God, got in the boat, the wind ceased and was calm. And the disciples came to shore. But it wasn't where they intended. They were intending to go up north, and they actually went more west to a town called Gennesaret, eight miles southwest of Bethsaida. So the wind blew them off course to this fertile uh, plain along the western coast of the Sea of Galilee. And the story ends with them coming ashore in this town that they had not planned on, and the people of this town had not planned on them coming there either. But because Christ had made such a name for himself in his miracles, in his ministry, the people realized, oh, this is Jesus Christ. This is the guy who can do a lot of really cool stuff. And so they start bringing people to him. So wherever Christ went, whether he was in the town, whether he was out in the country, they brought people to him to be healed. And he did that. And if you look at verse 53, Mark gives us a summary of of the ministry of Christ here. He was healing everyone. And it's also a transition for the ministry of Christ, because he's going to depart this area in the coming chapters, and he's going to travel west to the coast, to the cities of Tyre and Sidon, ancient cities. That's where he's going to go next. We'll read about that next week in Mark chapter 7. He's going to travel there. So here Mark gives us a summary and then a transition of of where we're going to go next in the gospel of Mark. And so that's, that's an overview of what Mark's trying to get across. And now I want you to see two really short, brief lessons of discipleship that we get from this story. Very brief, very short lessons of discipleship. The first lesson is is very simple. It's this. God does not forget about you. God does not forget about his people. If we read this story, it would seem at first glance that the disciples are in the midst of this strong wind and they're on their own. They're rowing hard, getting nowhere. They're actually going the wrong direction. And where is Jesus Christ? 
He's being all spiritual on the side of a hill praying by himself. And as you read through the story, there's an initial thought of, has he forgotten his people? Has he forgotten his disciples? And the the story reminds us very clearly that Christ does not forget the needs of his people. His people are never alone. He always provides for his people. And some of you this morning, if you're going through a difficult time, if you're going through a painful time, you need that reminder. I need that reminder that you are not alone, that Christ does not forget about you. He doesn't have other things to worry about that are more important than you. He does remember you. He does remember your needs, and he will meet them, that you are not alone. And we need that reminder because there is a lie that we can believe from Satan, from the enemy that Scripture tells us about, that we are alone, that we're on our own. And this, this story tells us we are not. Despite how we might feel from day to day, we are not alone, that Christ will be there for you. He will bring peace. He will bring comfort because he will bring his presence into your life. We know that not because it's in the sermon, but we know that for two very good reasons. The first is this. The Bible teaches it, that God is always faithful. The Bible says that God is not sometimes faithful, occasionally faithful, faithful on the weekends, faithful on holidays. It says he's always faithful. Not just when you're obedient and doing your best, then he'll do his best. God is always faithful. He makes a covenant of grace to his people. And when we fall short, he will always be faithful, despite the times when we're broken and falling short. That's the first reason. The second reason to believe that you're not alone, despite what happens in your life, is because the cross of Jesus Christ demonstrates that he has not forgotten about you. Apart from the cross, you are facing sin and the consequences of sin, which is death, the Bible calls it hell, on your own and living in guilt and shame. But because God the Father sent his son to die on the cross, it demonstrates he did not forget about you. He did not leave you to face the consequences of your sin on your own. In fact, he gave his life for you. And so that if you repent and put your faith in him, you have the hope of eternal life because you cannot do it on your own. The lengths that God will go to to remember you are sacrificing his own life on the cross for you for your sins, for mine. God has not forgotten about you. That's the first lesson. The second lesson is this. The difficulty that the disciples experienced on the Sea of Galilee when they were rowing, the difficulty that they experienced was the direct result of obeying the Lord. The difficulty that they experienced was the direct result of obeying the Lord. The harrowing circumstances happened because they obeyed Jesus Christ, not because they disobeyed him. And the result was they were caught in these fierce winds. The plan of Jesus Christ for his disciples there involved the appearance of danger and harm for the disciples. One one scholar wrote this about it. It's very well written. He said, It was not through stubborn self-will of the disciples, but through direct obedience to the command of Christ that the disciples found themselves in danger. The storm did not show that they deviated from the path of God's will. Instead, God's path for them lay through the storm. And the application is simple. If you're following the Lord, if you're following him as he's revealed himself in Scripture and the Word of God, then you will experience pain and difficulty. Not you may experience, but you will experience that. Pain and anxiety, fear, doubt, loneliness, brokenness, problems with your health, problems with finances or career or family. The path of following the Lord Jesus Christ is not a path that leads through a flowered garden with rainbows and fountains and all kinds of nice flowers. Sometimes it can, but sometimes it doesn't. Following Christ is more of a pilgrim path. It is more of a pilgrim journey. It's a road that Christ takes you on that he's going to make you more like himself by removing the things in your life that do not reflect his glory. And sometimes it's difficult. And I think that's important this morning because it's something we need to hear, you need to hear, and something our church needs to preach. Because for many of us, for, for much of American Christianity, Christianity is sold as something where God wants you to be healthy and wealthy always. It's called a health and wealth gospel, a prosperity gospel. And you see that in some of the largest churches. You see that in a lot of churches, not just large churches in America. If you go to Barnes & Noble and go to a, the Christian section on books, you're going to see a lot of that there. And we need to be clear that that's not biblical. 
no matter what church preaches it, no matter what author writes about it, sometimes God's going to take you through difficult experiences. And that's not bad news. That's good news because he's going to do something through it. There's the promise of Romans 8. All things work together for good. Not because we're good people, but because he's a good God and he's faithful. And so I don't want that to be bad news this morning. But I want it to be clear because we live in a culture of a superficial American Christian culture that tells you that everything's always going to be good if you're following him and everything's going to be easy and God wants your best financially and, and with your health. And that's just not true. It's not true. Obedience to Christ means you will suffer. And you will experience pain and difficulty. But God is with you in the midst of that. He is leading you through that. To put it very simply, obedience doesn't mean avoidance. Obedience to God doesn't mean avoidance of pain and difficulty. This story here tells us that you're not forgotten, that God is with you, and that ultimately he will see you through everything, the storms of life, the pain of life. Remember years ago, back in, (laughs) too many years ago, back in college, um, one night, a couple of buddies of mine uh, from the dorm went on an unexpected, unexpected little adventure in the mountains of Tennessee. You probably remember this. Um, me and two guys from Georgia, Jordan and Taylor, got in my car one night, and we were going to drive up to the top of this mountain and do some night hiking, just something fun to do, to a place called Buzzards Point. It's kind of a rocky little lookout point looking out over the mountains in eastern Tennessee. It was a great plan. We're going to have lots of fun hiking with some flashlights and just hang out. But the night became more of an adventure than we had planned for, because as we were driving up and then got out and started hiking, a severe thunderstorm came into the area um, at just the right time. And so our little night hike turned into hiking in the middle of a thunderstorm with rain and heavy lightning. And so instead of doing the smart thing, which was, hey, let's just maybe head back and watch some TV, let's go down on the second floor and prank little Ricky on the second floor um, and have some fun, we decided let's just hike in the middle of this thunderstorm. That'd be pretty cool. We've never done that before. Um, Brilliant plan, brilliant. Um, So in the middle of us hiking, I can still remember about 150, 200 feet in front of us at one point, lightning struck and we kind of paused, we were soaking wet and realized, what are we doing? I was like, hey, let's just keep going. Um, And these two fools listened to me and we kept going. So we hiked to the top and we got to the top and we kind of, Stood there for a little bit, a lot of lightning we could see, like, hey, let's, let's start hiking back down. Um, it took us several hours, we got back to my car, we were soaking wet, we were cold. And as we started to drive back, we're on top of this mountain, we started to drive back, something had happened in the midst of our new adventure of hiking in the middle of a thunderstorm, something had happened during our hike. And that is the little creek that ran through the river, had, through the, around the mountain, had turned into a river because there was severe flash flooding. And we found out really just in time, because as we got in our car, my car, <laughs> we were driving down, there was a hill, and there was a little bridge through the creek, and then you'd go up another hill. As we're coming down this hill, we got about, I don't know, 50, 100 feet, I don't know, and I realized, I mean, my windshield wipers were going 100 miles an hour. I was like, hey, guys, I don't see the bridge. <laughs> uh, do you see the bridge? And we didn't see it, and so I hit the brakes, put it in park, turned it off, and we got out of the car to look, and we couldn't see the bridge because there was a river running over it, and we were almost drove into the river, and so we decided we need to think about how we're going to get home because there's no other way to get back to the campus. And so I can remember, this is Taylor, um, trying to decide if we could cross the the creek that had become a river and seeing him not even halfway across the river, water up to his stomach, holding onto a tree saying, I don't think we can make it. I was like, yeah, it's a good, yeah, we can't make it. Um, Let's just hang out in the truck. Um, So we didn't make it. We had to stay in the car all night. And this was, again, before... Um, this is before iPhones. This is, I mean, this is before 4G LTE networks. I mean, we had little phones that had somewhat good service. So I called a buddy who lived kind of close who had a car. And I called Mark and I was like, hey, Mark. And kind of the phone call kept going in and out and eventually kind of got the message. And at one point we're on top of the hill. There's the river down here. And we could see the lights of his little green Prius over here and realize there's no way we're going to be able to do this. Uh, and then he took off in his prison, went home, went to bed. Um, great, great friend, uh, great friend. Um, he finally got the message. He knew we were there. We weren't forgotten about. He knew we were there. Everything was fine. We just needed to stay in our car. And we stayed until maybe five or six until the water died down. And then we went out, walked again. We thought we could cross it, and we did cross it and got home. 
the point of that story is this. We had some pretty good plans, but ultimately they led to an unexpected danger, adventure. But even in the midst of that, we weren't forgotten. My friend Mark and others knew we were there. We weren't forgotten about. We weren't going to be isolated on this mountain on our own because we were cold, we were wet, we were hungry, (laughs) we needed to eat. We weren't forgotten about in the midst of that. And really, those are the two points of this story from Mark chapter 6. Good plans that the disciples had that were given by the Lord led directly into a challenge, into a painful situation. But secondly, the Lord was with them. They were not forgotten about. They were not on their own trying to solve this problem on their own. God was with them. He came to them. And this morning, the reminder here is a good reminder to obey the Lord, to follow His word, but to know that that might lead to unexpected adventures, pain, difficulty, because obedience is not avoidance. But He is with you. The Lord is with you. You're not forgotten. Because the God who has led you to where you are today, this morning, is going to lead you tomorrow, on Monday and Tuesday, and the rest of your life until your life is over and you're in the presence of God. He will be with you in the midst of that. It is part of discipleship, becoming like Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, this miracle of, of The Lord Jesus Christ walking on water, demonstrating the power and the presence of God in the midst of a a painful situation, a difficult situation for the disciples. Lord, help us to learn that uh, the power and the presence of of the Almighty God is is within us through your Holy Spirit as we follow you and obey your word, and that you will take us through storms in life, that you will take us through painful chapters of life, but you will be with us in the midst of those, and we will not be forgotten. We thank you for those promises. We, we pray now as we go to your sacrament that your Holy Spirit would spiritually feed us, nourish us to our own growth in grace, as the Westminster Catechism says, that we would grow in grace through this sacrament. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.